Hello and welcome back to FPV Reviews. Today we'll be discussing solar-powered aircraft for perpetual flight and their design considerations. Electric propulsion systems for aircraft are absolutely the future for most applications. Whether the energy comes from a fuel-powered generator, power takeoff from a turbofan being used in conjunction with the electric system, a fuel cell, battery power, solar cells, or a combination of two or more of these power sources. Today we'll be examining the challenges of using solar power, the advantages and the ways that which we can leverage as many factors as possible to our advantage to get the maximum performance from a solar aircraft, which is what it takes to fly perpetually. With such limited total power available, the airframe should be kept absolutely as light as possible and an airfoil should be used with a relatively high coefficient of lift, which also has a low coefficient of drag, and at the very specific indicated airspeed, hence low Reynolds numbers, that will be operating at. First, we'll decide how large to make the aircraft and what aspect ratio we'll be using. Usually the optimization for a long duration air solar aircraft will be designed to achieve a minimal sink rate in glide, which would be the design goal if the sole purpose is for endurance or maximum altitude potential. At these relatively low Reynolds numbers, we would do well to use a fairly high aspect ratio, but not nearly as high as performance sailplanes. This aspect ratio may not have the best lift to drag ratio, but the minimal sink rate is more important due to its inherent structural advantages and thus lower structural mass, as well as being the best option for endurance in any aircraft type. We might further reduce the aspect ratio slightly in order to make the total surface area greater on the top of the wing than that which would be ideal for a pure glider, as we need lots of wing area for our solar array hence more power available, preferably without sacrificing the aerodynamic efficiency too much. It's definitely a compromise when viewed from a purely aerodynamic perspective. This aspect ratio and size will help us obtain a measurement for the wing cord, which we'll use to calculate the Reynolds number for the wing a little more precisely. Now that we have that, we can go looking for an airfoil. The speed range that the aircraft will be operating at doesn't have to be very large, as we're primarily interested in having as low a sink rate as possible, and that means flying relatively slow. Because the flight envelope that we're targeting for this type of aircraft is small, we'll be looking for an airfoil having a relatively small but deep drag bucket at the desired Reynolds numbers, when looking at the coefficient of drag and angle of attack polar's graphed. Now that we have a figure for the exact coefficient of lift for the airfoil, or pretty close, we may want to go back and recalculate the Reynolds numbers using the cord, indicated airspeed at the projected density altitude that we aim to fly at, and other factors such as projected gross weight. The coefficient of lift should also be at an angle of attack that provides a healthy amount of lift, although it won't be at the airfoil's peak lift. We'll design many other parts of the plane to be aligned with this angle of attack. This will help us quantify performance characteristics, but is not absolutely necessary for success in the overall project. The important thing is to end up with a large wing, relatively thick airfoil, low weight, and sufficient dynamic stability. We'll also want to design wingtips for the aircraft that are not too ambitious, taking into account the low Reynolds numbers that we're working at and that the air is very viscous in this circumstance, or at least behaves that way. The complex, elongated wingtips, which work well at higher Reynolds numbers, will not be so beneficial at these lower numbers. We'll also need ailerons and other control surfaces such as flaps or spoilers which are somewhat larger than a conventional aircraft because of the slow airspeed which this type of aircraft will be flying at. 
The structure should allow for some flexibility, as such a light structure is susceptible to damage by wind shear, and allowing it to flex somewhat will give time for it to spill air and absorb the force that will be imparted. It's also possible to relieve aerodynamic pressure on the wing structure by using the control surfaces such as the ailerons and flaps to dump air, temporarily moving them in the wrong direction to help defend against the potentially damaging effects of wind shear acting on the airframe. The aft part of the fuselage should be long in order to provide a good moment arm for effective stabilization of the aircraft in pitch and yaw. Truss or tube structures are the most efficient in terms of weight, providing good torsional rigidity and strength. A triangular truss is usually desirable as its strength to weight ratio is very good and presents less parasitic or surface drag due to its smaller surface area relative to a box type truss. It can also provide adequate lateral resistance reducing the necessary area for the stabilizers. The top of the triangle structure also provides a near ideal location for the mounting of additional solar cells. A single larger fuselage is also a more efficient structure than multiple tail booms, although there are some designs which use two or more for other reasons, such as when used in conjunction with extremely high aspect ratio wings. If implemented with a control system capable of managing the flex and torsion of the wing with active controls, it's possible to use these multiple tails and control surfaces mounted on them to decrease the loads on the wing during flight through turbulence, enabling the wing to have an even higher aspect ratio than what is normally possible from a structural standpoint. As the wingspan grows, at some point it would be necessary to use asymmetrical thrust from the aircraft's propulsion systems to control the yaw axis, as the rudders would no longer have the moment arm to do so. Use of lifting stabilizers also becomes practical for an aircraft with such a narrow flight envelope. The most aerodynamic efficiency for the vertical stabilizer can be achieved using a single stabilizer with a relatively high aspect ratio. Since such low levels of electrical power are available from a solar aircraft, the efficiency of the propulsion system is also very key to the success of the design. Since the aircraft will fly so slowly, very little total energy will be required. However, as much thrust as possible at the target airspeed is desirable. For this reason, an extremely large disc area with an extremely low disc loading is most effective. We won't be getting as extreme in these areas as, say, a human-powered helicopter in terms of disc area and disc loading, but we'll be taking hints from the same principles that are used there and will probably be limited in propeller diameter by more practical limitations such as ground clearance. Before we actually get to the diameter which is best for aerodynamic efficiency in such low speed forward flight, we may push even further and use a launching cart for deployment, counting on the propellers perhaps being damaged upon an eventual landing if we're not able to stop them or park them at a certain orientation relative to the ground. Most perpetual aircraft actually run their propulsion system during the night and use a combination of energy stored in their batteries and in their altitude potential of the aircraft to keep them airborne through the dark period, referred to as the time between souls. At some point in the morning and evening, there will be a balance in power referred to as solar neutral morning and solar neutral evening. These are key times to monitor as they provide key data points which can inform strategic decisions with regard to power management and flight planning. Teetering propellers 
usually used only on helicopter blades, can actually be useful for a solar aircraft's propulsion system, as they can passively help to keep the propeller arc at a right angle to the airflow, which may be fluctuating due to wind shear or turbulence, increasing overall efficiency as it allows each individual prop blade to maintain a constant angle of attack as it travels through its arc, also reducing P effect and lessening the stress on the motor shaft, bearings, and motor mounts at the same time. Vibration and associated negative effects are also reduced. Many solar aircraft concepts are shown with a single large propeller. However, there are several good reasons why actual solar aircraft usually end up using a multi-motor configuration or form of distributed electric propulsion. The main reason is that the weight of each propulsion pod and its structural load on the aircraft airframe can be more easily handled if they are spread out over the wingspan. Additionally, the time it takes to increase revolutions of a large propeller are much greater than with multiple smaller propulsion units which can spool up much faster. Additionally, differential thrust between units on multiple propulsion systems means more options for their use in yaw stabilization, increased redundancy, and many smaller units will be easily handled or swapped by ground maintenance crews opposed, as opposed to one large propulsion system. The reliability of electric motors and their controllers means that although the probability of failure is higher, however, even with four or more motors, it's still at acceptable levels, especially considering that the redundancy means the aircraft will be recovered successfully in the unlikely event of a failure in one. If the propellers counter-rotate, it's also possible to eliminate torque effect, P effect, and slipstream effect, as well as to balance gyroscopic precession, providing for more predictable handling. You can see the smoke here caught by one of the GoPros coming out of the motor pod. In the case of aircraft such as Solar Impulse 2, it's also possible to park just the outboard propellers, retaining thrust, differential control, while protecting the ground crew that's, who are handling the wings on landing, all at the same time. Direct drive motors have the obvious advantage in that there are no losses in efficiency of the power delivery, but are limited in motor can or motor housing diameter. Hence, the efficiency of the motor itself is limited. They could be made with a greater diameter, however, the penalty in aerodynamic drag is larger than the gain at some point, especially since the motor is directly behind the propeller it is in the area of the highest airspeed velocity. Use of smaller, higher RPM motors with a gearbox gets around this problem. However, there are losses associated with the gearboxes, as well as an increase in cost, increase in weight, and a decrease in reliability. Some designers have circumvented this problem by placing a direct drive motor further back in the pod or fuselage where it can still be large with less aerodynamic penalty and used a tubular drive shaft to transfer the torsion to the propeller housed within a moderately sized spinner inducting only the amount of air necessary to cool the motor separately. Solar cell selection is also key. New cell types are constantly emerging efficiency is improving and cost is dropping due to advances in material science, innovation, and mass manufacturing. It's important to note that some types of cells which provide the best overall peak power output do not necessarily do so at suboptimal angles to the light source. And the best solution for an aircraft which is constantly moving and is almost never at the optimal angle is not necessarily the highest peak output cell type. Flexibility and encapsulation must also be considered in terms of weight, longevity, and lastly cost.
Some companies offer tailored solutions for solar aircraft using high-efficiency solar film cells, which can be a near-optimal solution as they have an ultra-low weight and high efficiency, but also probably the highest cost of any of the solutions, and there will likely be limits to the size of the panels which they can produce. Arrangement of the cells on the aircraft is also key to success. Much like batteries, solar cells are often wired in series banks to obtain the correct voltage range, and then the banks are arranged in groups to fill the available area. Making sure that the cell connector tabs and the cells themselves create a loop back to the central power distribution point will save weight by helping eliminate excess wiring. Modern MPPT, or multi-point power tracking controllers, can be used to make sure that the voltage differential from the best potential solar cell output voltage is used even in sub-optimal lighting conditions while providing the proper charge voltage for the batteries over their discharge range. However, the closer to an optimal voltage differential is kept, the more efficient the whole system will be. For some simple model aircraft, the use of direct solar with a cutoff switch to prevent overcharging or Zener diodes to bleed off excess energy in the form of heat can be used to save the weight, cost, and complexity of an MPPT controller while preventing damage to the batteries. Lithium ion batteries provide the best gravimetric energy density at this time and the best ones are cylindrical cells similar to the ones used in long-range electric cars. In an aircraft, especially one that is meant to fly at high altitudes, cooling can easily be provided by controlling the airflow around the batteries. To successfully achieve that uniformly over one discharge cycle of an electric aircraft is relatively easy, but since perpetual aircraft must perform to the max over many consecutive discharge cycles, localized heat buildup can become an issue if proper precautions are not taken. All cells must receive approximately equal airflow, and it also helps if the cells are standing upright, rather than laying down in such applications. This is more easily conceptualized than achieved, and it may take several iterations of the design process of the battery pack to get it right. Early detection of heat buildup by placing temperature sensors at key points in the pack will notify of a problem before it gets out of hand and damages cells. Good battery thermal management is not only cooling, but also providing insulation at higher altitudes and lower temperatures. Lithium batteries do not like extremely cold temperatures either. Insulating the entire pack is easy, but again, we run into the problem of localized heat buildup and also localized cold spots in the pack, both of which can cause poor performance and imbalance of the pack. Again, uniform forced airflow when the vents to the insulated pack are closed is the ideal way of dealing with the issue as the solution works for cooling and heating alike. It's also possible to separate the battery into smaller groups of cells which are thermally tied to each other and actively cool and heat each group individually using a microcontroller to monitor the groups and make decisions of when to open a vent or heat a resistor wire using electrical energy from the batteries themselves. It's also possible to use an existing liquid cooling system such as those which have already been developed for long-range electric cars. However, there is a significant weight penalty associated with the liquid cooling system. This is acceptable in automobiles as they are far more weight tolerant, and it is also necessary because cars have a much greater charge and discharge rate. A perpetual solar-powered aircraft necessarily has a very low charge rate and discharge rate, and also spends a significant amount of time doing both at the same time 
effectively passing a large portion of the electrical power directly from the solar production system to the propulsion system. This places essentially no load or very little load on the batteries themselves, allowing them time to regulate their overall temperature and distribute any residual concentrated heat buildup that may have occurred during the last charge or discharge cycle. With unmanned aircraft, the limiting factors of how long the aircraft can stay airborne include battery, solar cell, and encapsulate degradation, as well as the covering aging on aircraft with open structures using film to create their aerodynamic surfaces. The harsh conditions of a more intense solar index at high altitudes, extreme temperatures, the associated contraction expansion cycles, radiation at high altitudes, will definitely take a toll on any aircraft, especially one that must be built from ultra-lightweight materials. The use of carbon composites at least means that fatigue life of the airframe itself will theoretically be very long, if not infinite. But the resin itself for these composite structures may degrade due to the harsh environment if not protected with a layer of paint that is UV resistant. At the very least, an aircraft that has been airborne at extreme altitudes for weeks or months may require some degree of refurbishment in order to return it to service. Ironically, if an unmanned aircraft can fly above 60,000 feet and penetrates that altitude while not above the airspace of any nation, it is also not subject to any airspace regulation, although the detectability and enforceability of these regulations are questionable anyway. The aircraft can be detected by various means, but if it is not tracked from the moment of launch and it is not broadcasting any signal which can identify it, then it's unlikely that any action will be taken by most government agencies. For one thing, taking any action would mean admitting the existence of a clandestine aircraft above their country and not knowing who is operating it, they will likely be reluctant to shoot it down in case it belongs to one of their allies or a stronger adversary with whom they do not want to start a conflict. Also, recovery of or extracting any useful data from the critical parts of the wreckage assuming they shot it down, in many areas is not assured, so the benefit of shooting it down would be very minimal. This is a practical gray area that is most likely being exploited by government agencies and private entities as we speak. For manned aircraft, there are additional challenges. The cabin must be heated, cooled, shade provided, some way to dispose of waste must be implemented, Food and drinking water must be stored. An autopilot capable of waking the pilot must be devised. An ample enough area must be provided for some degree of stretching and exercise. And if higher altitudes are to be reached, a pressure suit would be used. Above about 12,500 feet, oxygen must be provided. And above about 40,000 feet, the pressure suit must be implemented although there are no examples of the use of pressure suits in this application to date, at least that we know of. Storing of oxygen for a human pilot requires carrying heavy canisters without any viable way to refill them in the air. For manned solar-powered aircraft, this is the current limitation for flight duration. Perhaps an ISRU, or in-situ resource utilization system, can someday be devised which can provide the necessary oxygen and sufficient power to compress it without weighing too much to carry on such an aircraft. This will definitely not be happening to a usable extent until the efficiency of solar cells and the energy density of batteries improves drastically. Even then, the lack of movement in a cramped cabin means that per manned perpetual aircraft may never be practical for applications except for adventures and record setters. The current solo non-stop record for time aloft and distance traveled in an aircraft was set by Andre Borschberg of the Swiss-built solar airplane Solar Impulse 2, 
flying from Nagoya, Japan to Hawaii over the course of four days, 21 hours, and 51 minutes in 2015. Congratulations. We hope you've enjoyed this episode regarding perpetual solar aircraft, and we hope this information is useful if you're contemplating or studying the design of such aircraft. We encourage all types of innovation in aircraft design. Feel free to put your comments uh, below this video, uh, anything you think about regarding the subject. Uh, give this video a big like. Be sure to subscribe so you don't miss any of the future episodes. Thanks for watching. Have a good one.